Right, let's start at the top. So Inception's a movie that I absolutely love. Why? This was nothing like I'd ever seen before and it completely blew my mind. Since first seeing it all the way back in 2010, it's stuck with me ever since and it's been a film that I constantly revisit. Though Christopher Nolan will likely go down as the man who made The Dark Knight, I think all in all that this is his best film. Written and directed by him, it feels like the quintessential Nolan film and it deals with all the techniques that he's now known for. There's a focus on a high level concept, non-chronological storytelling and major action set pieces with a big ensemble cast. Man brought together his dream team, pun not intended, and you can see why he's continued to work with so many of these actors. Like The Dark Knight, Nolan shot the entire movie himself without ever using a second unit director, and in case you don't know, this is basically a Norman Hollywood. What filmmakers often do is that they'll shoot the big scenes and someone else will go off and do other things that take up a lot of time. However, you can tell that he put his all into this and initially when he pitched it, he thought he'd have the script ready in a month. Eight years later, he finally finished it off and the movie's absolutely meticulous from the top to bottom. Now, I broke down the film all the way back in 2020, but I just had to return to it and unearth all the details that I've noticed since. We will be covering some of the things I talked about in that and I also want to go over the potentially hidden twist layered in the movie. Either way, this is going to be classed as our ultimate breakdown and this video, we're going to discuss it all. However, what I want to talk about up top is the ambiguous ending that left a lot of people dreaming up their theory times on what's going on. Coming out of the cinema, the biggest debate was whether Cobb returned home or if he was actually just stuck in a dream imagining it all. Now this is something Nolan's actually cleared up and he confirmed that in the end, Cobb made it out. There's a little detail hidden in the movie that Nolan has stated shows what's going on. Throughout the film, whenever the character's in a dream, he can be seen wearing his wedding ring, whereas when he's awake, he doesn't. This is because his wife Mallory is very much alive when he's sedated, and thus he doesn't want to quite cast away the memory of her. She represents the guilt that he feels over causing her death because he did his own inception to make a disregard reality. Trapped in a dream with Cobb for over 50 years, the only way to escape this was by seemingly getting killed. This allowed them to wake up and travel back into the real world, but Cobb planted the idea that they'd just gone up a layer. Thus, Mal invited Cobb out to once more die together, but unfortunately for her, this whole thing was actually real. Now, Cobb then took her totem and seemingly used it throughout the movie as a way to assess whether he was in the real world or not. Each character is told to use a personal item they only know the truth about, and thus, people won't be able to trap them in a dream. Having knowledge of someone's possession allows an extraction to go ahead and we actually see this demonstrated early in the film. Sado's secret love nest is recreated in full detail but the carpet fabric being wrong is what gives it away. Now, this was a fault due to the lack of research but it shows how knowing your totems the way to tell what's real. Characters are supposed to keep these items to themselves and we're told in the film that you shouldn't touch another's totem. However, that rule's broken and the fact that the spinning top belonged to Mal also shows why it's unlikely that he'd ever use it. Now in 2020, I theorised Cobb's totem was actually his wedding ring and this pretty much confirms that it's always been the case. Again, throughout the movie whenever he's in a dream, you can catch the character wearing it on his left hand and this is because in the dream, Mal's still alive. Now on this watch through, I actually kept a close eye on his left hand and I noticed that he tends to hide it when he's with the group. It's always kind of placed out of the way and it's such a clever way to show that in the end, this is actually his true totem. Completely paranoid, it makes sense he'd have a second way to check, and this is in case the totem topples over. Now if someone was able to intercept him and they knew that he used the totem, then they could probably try and replicate it just like the carpet. So the ring's his real one, and this is just in case it ever comes to a point where he needs that reassurance. Now Nolan stated at the end that when he comes across his family, he leaves the top spinning for a specific reason. Normally, Cobb would completely obsess over it, but the fact he doesn't care to look shows that it doesn't matter. He's finally happy and back with his family and whether it's a dream or not, it doesn't matter to him. However, if we check his hand, we can see that it's the real world and that the character made it home and back to his family. Look who's here. Now it's possible that there's a secret inception in the film and that the team's actually there to get Cobb to finally leave his dreams. In order to do this though, he has to leave Mal behind and take the job which flies him out to the US. Now in order to discuss this, we have to look at what Inception is and how it also fits what happens to him in the movie. We learn that in order for Inception to work, it has to be inspired and that you can't just flat out tell someone what you want them to think. We see this demonstrated on Fisher and this happens when they reinforce the idea that his father actually wanted him to break up the company. 
Now, though the saga believes they've decided to do it themselves, they're actually manipulated into it by the use of repetition. Now, we will discuss all the instances where this happens with Fisher, but for Cobb, there's a number of clues throughout. Firstly, is the big song that plays in the movie, which is known as Je ne regret rien. I butchered that, but this French tune is dropped in a signal to the team that a kick's about to happen. On the surface, it's a nice little song, but it actually holds a lot of meaning behind it. The song is very much an inspirational one, and it's about someone letting go of all the regrets that they have in their life. Frank Sinatra did a play on this for his infamous song My Way, but a lot's going on in the original version that hints towards cop psychology. The song's actually about having no regrets and leaving the past behind, something that the protagonist refuses to do because of his wife's death. Cobb even has an elevator that provides access to floors filled with regret, and in the end it's clear he has a lot he'd like to change. However, as we close out, he finally lets go and reunites with his family, shedding the idea of Mal, which has held him back throughout the film. He's moving on to something else, and the team playing this song could be them subliminally telling him to move on from Mal. The singer is French herself, and in a nice little tie-in, Marion Cotillard actually played her in a film. Now whether it's intentional or not, this idea of a French woman singing about having no regrets, it could be something that could tie in with Mal. The whole movie is basically built around her, and even early on we see a picture by artist Francis Bacon. This was actually one the artist created after the death of his lover, and he and Cobb both share some striking similarities. The warped face on it symbolised that he was unable to fully recreate his lost love, which is something that Cobb also says to Mal. I can't imagine you with all your complexity, all your perfection, all your imperfection. Another big moment is a line that Mal says in the film, Come back to reality, Tom. Now at the time, this is pretty much a throwaway line, but it could be reinforcing the notion that Cobb needs to come back. We see a similar tactic used in the film at one point when it's hinted to Fisher that his father wanted him to be his own man. It'd be the end of the entire empire as we know it. Destroy my whole inheritance. Why would he suggest such a thing? Similar to the Miles moment, this is a throwaway line, but it's dropped so that when Fisher gets deeper into the dream, it's something that he stews upon. Throughout life, there will be things that people say to you that neither of you pay that much attention to at the time, but there'll be something that you constantly think about because of what implications they have. For example, if you have an argument with your ex before you break up, she, she might say something that sticks with you like, you'll never have a million subscribers, but uh, it'll keep powering you on, and I promise, mate, you'll, you'll eventually get there. Now going back to how this could be an inception on Cobb, when he says goodbye to his wife, it's even similar to how Fisher says goodbye to his father. Both must let them go, and Fisher's father dies similar to how Mal does upon Cobb confronting her. So we can see that one throwaway line uttered in a seemingly meaningless moment can be built upon the further into the dream you go. Now other clues include that Cobb seems to exist in a reality that's very much like a dream where he's chased by projections. Said to be an agency, they act much like the subconscious and try to take him down at several points. Thus this entire thing could just be another layer with a team breaking in to make him think that he has to return home. On top of this, Saito is arguably the person that actually adds to the theory of Cobb having to let go. This is because there's a line that's repeated throughout the movie, and he says, Do you want to take a leap of faith? Or become an old man? Filled with regret? I'm an old man. Filled with regret. Similar to a three-layer dream, this forces Cobb to question whether he wants to live the rest of his life filled with regret, alone, and away from his family, or if he wants to go back. If he holds on to the idea of Mal, then he'll definitely end up like that, and he'll forever be fleeing from the enigmatic agents. I think the old man filled with regret line is very similar to the line about coming back to reality, and the end of the movie in which Cobb comes face to face with Sido could be a revelation of that. Here he sits opposite an old, lonely man, and Cobb literally sees his own fate laid out before him. Now this happens after his conversation with Mal, but it still shows that he's now seeing things that will continue to make him travel down the path at this point, and he needs to escape the dream. Cobb could remain here, but he's told to take a leap of faith to return to the real world, and finally be back with his family. Now another interesting line Mal says is, You said you'd written that we grow together. And this is something that's kept Cobb holding on to her. It was one of their wedding vows, but the conversation at the end makes Cobb finally realise that they actually did. The pair lived a lifetime together deep down in the dream, and once he finally realises this, he's able to let go. We're also told in the film that a positive idea works better than a negative one, and this too may be the reason why the end feels like such a win for him. 
When we look at it for what it really is, the true Inception was putting the idea in his head that he should leave all his regrets behind and return home. So that might be the hidden Inception in the film, but let me know below what you think as we get into the movie. Now one of the coolest easter eggs that's been spotted in the film is the fact that if you take the character's names first letters, they spell out Dream Pace. This is because Dom, Robert, Eames, Arthur, Mal, Saito, Peter, Ariadne and Yusef, they spell Dream's Pay. Now the names also have specific meanings attached to dreams and how the characters operate in the film. Cobb means dream in Sanskrit and it's also a name Nolan used in his first film. Titled the following, this starred Alex Hoare who's also an architect in real life. His first name Dom also means home in Polish and the other characters share deeper layers too. Ariadne is actually from an ancient Greek myth and the name comes from the story Theseus and the Minotaur. In the story, she helped Theseus escape the maze, and in the film, she does the same thing with Cobb. Ariadne is someone who builds mazes as well, which we see her doing on the job in the film. Now, Yusef is the Arabic version of Joseph, who's someone that interpreted the Pharaoh's dreams when we look at the Bible. Eames is a nod to Charles and Bidis Eames, who are credited as revolutionaries in industrial and modern architecture. Fisher and his father have some cool things too, as Maurice Fisher is a nod to M.C. Escher. His full name was Maurice Cornelius Escher, whose work inspired some of the visual effects. His son Robert is named after Bobby Fischer, who was also a champion chess player. Now the name Fischer itself may be a nod to the legends of King Arthur, and this is due to the similarities that his dreams have to Fischer's kingdom. The wounds that the characters received were reflected in his castle, and throughout the film the landscape shifts depending on how he is mentally. Arthur may be a nod to this as well, and originally James Franco was in talks to play the character. However, Joseph Gordon-Levitt showed up to the audition wearing a suit and as soon as they saw him like that, they knew that he was perfect. Amal can also mean ill in French, Spanish and Portuguese and this could be referring to how she acts as a sickness. That's still up for debate, but the cast and characters themselves also reflect a lot of Nolan's career. During an interview with Entertainment Weekly, he talked about how the roles in Inception were some of that of filmmaking. Cobb is the director, Arthur produces, and Ariadne is considered the set design. Cobb even dresses like how Nolan does throughout the movie, and he could sort of be seen as a self-insert. Now I know that's a dirty word these days, but a lot of time when people are crafting stories, they do often put themselves in it to help flesh out the world. Either way, Eames plays different roles because he's an actor, and Saito's the studio that's in control. Lastly, Fish is seen as being the audience, and you can tell Nolan pulled from his own experience in order to craft these roles. Anyway, that takes us into the movie itself, which opens with Cobb washing up on the shore. In the middle of the film, Cobb talks us through how dreams work, and he says, You never really remember the beginning of a dream, do you? You always wind up right in the middle of what's going on. This is very much how the movie opens as well, and Nolan said he wanted the film to open up much like a dream for the viewer. The end credits of the film reflect this too, when the title text Inception appears three times in the credits. This is meant to represent the three layers, and as we watch the text pop up, we're coming further out of the dream that the movie's taken us through. Now on the show, we see Cobb's children for the first time, but he refuses to look at them. This is because he knows that if he does, he may be tempted to remain in the dream with them. The vision of Mal was a temptress too, who wanted to keep him in this reality, and I think that she purposely represented a siren. In case you don't know, according to the myths, these were apparently beautiful women that would sing to sailors at sea, and in the end, they'd lure them to their deaths. I don't think it's a coincidence that this opening takes place on a beach and the location has the kids also building sandcastles. This is something we see both Cobb and Mal doing during their time in limbo and this was the pair constructing their dream world. However, the children were never there which is what called them back and I love how we have this echo of iconography. Now Cobb is taken to Saito's palace and this is the same location Arthur constructed for him when they first met. As we know, all of a dreamer's subconscious can exist down on this layer, and it makes a lot of sense how he was able to copy it so well. Now, I love the cut back and forth between these two times without any warning, and just like a dream, things happen without explanation. Sado says, Are you here to kill me? Which we know in fact he is, due to that being how one escapes the dream. Sado carefully examines the top and spins it, and him touching it once more shows that this can't be Cobb's real token. Anyway, we cut to the past and see Cobb carrying out a heist on Sato's corporate plans for all of his competitors. This is known as extraction and it involves stealing secrets from someone's subconscious. During dreams, people's sense of logic and perception is lowered and thus in the end, they're easier to manipulate. We see this is the case here too, with just the mention of a secret causing Sato to look over to where the safe is hidden. 
Instantly, his mind fills this with knowledge, and the pitch allows them to complete the first part of their plan. Nolan brilliantly shows us how time moves differently depending on the layers, as we cut to a watch and see it speeding up. On this layer is Nash's subconscious, which is currently running riot, searching for the dreamers. Working like antibodies, they know someone's in his mind, and will do whatever they can to get rid of the group. Now this devastation on the surface is affecting things up top, and to make things worse, Mal sent to the dream. As we know, she died by jumping from a height, and we somewhat get a little nut to her actions with her first line. If I jumped, would I survive? Now the artwork by Bacon, Mal says, Looks like Arthur's taste. And as we discussed earlier, the character is somewhat based on the idea Bacon was bringing across here. Now if the colouring and distortion on the face looks familiar, it's because Nolan used Bacon's work as a basis for his Joker. It adds an extra dimension to the scene, and we can see his cobs torn between the mission and her. Did the children miss me? Now from this point he starts working his way through the compound, and Cobb uses a silencer to keep himself hidden. To be extra safe, he also puts his hand over the gun to catch the cartridge, as it rolling on the floor will make more noise. Now Cobb gets the secrets, but he's caught by Saito, who was informed of what they were doing by Mal. As we know, Mal's an extension of Cobb, and there's actually a cool little moment here which gives that away. When Saito discovers that Cobb managed to steal his secrets, Mal can actually be seen smiling for a split second, showing she's happy he got away. Now as the dream collapses, Cobb has to check the secrets out before it comes crashing down, and this is such an outstanding way to open up the movie. Water is used a great effect here to instantly wake someone up, and if you've ever had a glass of water chucked over you as you're sleeping, then you'll know what I mean. Anyway, after things go down worse in a YouTube apology with a ukulele, Cobb and Co wake up on board a train. Cobb leaves as quickly as he can, and he says, Why, well, he's not gonna check every compartment. Well, I don't like trains. Now in the movie, we learn that he and his wife used a train as a way to kill them so that they could wake up. Cobb is constantly tormented by this train, and it shows up in the movie at very awkward moments. The train carries a number 3502 on it, and we actually discover that this was the room that he and his wife spent their anniversary in. Another number which appears in the film is 528491, and Fisher comes up with this random sequence when he's later questioned. The first six numbers that come to your head right now. I have no idea. Right now! I said right now! Right now! 528491. It then appears as the blonde lady from Westworld's phone number, and it's also part of the room numbers that the team stay in. The top room is 528, and the room directly below it is 491. Now eventually, this all pays off, and in the end, Fisher opens the safe with the code 528491. The soundtrack also has a track titled 528491 on it, and if we look at the titles of the songs, then these words are all a specific length. The words get shorter and shorter as we go into the middle of the soundtrack because the characters are going deeper into the dream. However, as they go further out of it, they then start to expand, and this represents the characters now exiting it. Now, if this hasn't blown your mind, then you should also know that hashtag 528491 can be used as a hex colour code to display the shade of sign which was used on a lot of branding in the movie. Now, in a heartbreaking phone call with his kids, we see just how torn up Cobb is over not being able to see them. Nolan's often been criticised for the lack of humanity in his movies, and this is something a lot of people levied towards Tenet. Leo felt this was the same with the script for Inception, and once he was cast, he actually spent months with Nolan working on the screenplay. Emma Thomas stated, The work DiCaprio did on his character with Chris made the movie less of a puzzle, and more of a story a character audiences could relate to. Now after being offered a job by Sado, he somewhat gives Cobb the idea that if he works for him, he can go and see his kids again. We also get Arthur explaining how Inception works. I say to you, don't think about elephants. What are you thinking about? Elephants. Right, but it's not your idea because you know I gave it to you. And this is actually an under the book Don't Think of an Elephant by George Lakoff. Huge shout outs to Reddit user X248X for pointing this out and the book itself is about conceptual framing. It talks about how certain words can be used to give someone a certain idea, which Arthur also thumbs up, clearly discussing here. Now Cobb then goes to Michael Caine, who at this point is a Nolan mainstay. I love the guy, and it may surprise you to learn that he actually only gets 3 minutes of screen time in the entire movie. Introduced to Ariadne, Cobb puts her through her paces, and he then gets her to go and design a maze. 
Now, obviously, elephant in the room is that the actor is now Elliot Page, so I'm just going to refer to the character by their name and she and her due to the character being female. No disrespect intended, uh, yeah, just got to get that out of the way. And initially, he gives her an notepad with a grid on it. Drawing a rectangular maze, she fails time and time again because the grid and their structures are holding her back. Thus, she flips the notepad around and draws it on the back of the pad, and we can see here there's no lines to guide her. These were subconsciously how she drew the maze, but not having them here allows her to think more freely. Cobb also can't tear this like it's a bit of paper, and because it makes the base of the book, it can't just be ripped out. Now, one thing we pointed out in our last breakdown is that the first circular maze they get doesn't actually have a way that you can solve it. The entrances are blocked off, and a lot of structures that the architects build aren't actually solvable, they're just there to look nice. Now, when planning out how they're going to carry out their heist, they spend the majority of the scenes deep down in the dream world. This is because time works differently in a dream, and using the time dilation that's present, they have longer to plan the mission. This idea of time working differently is something that people have had fun with outside of the movie, and cable listings even had the film saying it runs for two days and nine hours. This is how long it would be if it was watched in a dream, and it gives the team so much more time. In the film we learn that 10 seconds in the first layer comes out at roughly 3 minutes, with this then being an hour when we get to the next layer. IMDB Trivia actually has the entire equation for this mapped out, and it states that time expands roughly 18 times every layer. Going over the numbers behind it, it means that every 10 seconds is roughly 7.5 days on the lowest level. Thus, 50 years would be around 10.5 hours sleep, meaning that Cobb and Mal just had a bit of a lie-in. Now, this is why Saito became an old man during the flight time that they have during the mission. Also, I think it's worth pointing out that Ken Watanabe and Nolan worked together on Batman Begins, but Nolan regretted him having such a small role. Thus, he gave him a much bigger part in this movie, and it of course opened the doors for films in the West like Godzilla and so on. Now, walking through Paris, Ariadne starts to fold the city in on itself, leading to one of the coolest and most unique effects in the entire movie. It might surprise you to learn that the movie only actually has 500 visual effects shots in it, with Nolan preferring to do as much as he could in the camera practically. This included things like the Penrose steps and zero gravity sequences, which were all done without CGI. They actually saved a lot on the budget by giving Ariadne a bun, and this meant that her hair stayed in place during these sequences. Hair in zero gravity is a tough thing to animate, and it's also why Brand is short hair in Interstellar. Now, after demonstrating the dangers of subconscious, we then meet Eames, played by Tom Hardy. When we come across the character, we can see him gambling, and we watch as he loses his hand. However, he still goes up with two full stacks of chips, which Cobb picks up and then starts to examine. He says his spelling hasn't improved, and that's because these chips he's cashing in are actually fake. As we pointed out in our first video, the Mombasa has two S's in it, and you son of a bitch, you couldn't even get that right. They talk about how Cobol Engineering is after him, and we see some of their agents situate at the bar. The Cobol job is actually a prequel comic for the film, and it ends with them going on the job to try and steal from Saito. Chase through the streets, as we mentioned earlier, this has made many believe that these agents are actually projections. The streets of the city actually act somewhat like a maze, and when we see the skyline at the start, it resembles this too. There's definitely that feeling here, and I love how Nolan uses this to mess with our minds. Now after he's saved by Saito, we then go and meet Yusef, who works with chemicals and also sedatives. You might notice his cat climbing around and licking a pop beside him, and this actually sets up a nice joke in the next scene. The next time we see the cat, it's asleep, so we can kind of guess what was in that. Now in the basement, we see the final performance by El Cameron, who at the time of release was 92 years old. He passed away 10 years after filming this, and even with his one line, he does a lot with so little. Now these are supposed to reflect opium dens and people who've become addicted to living in their dreams. Earl's character says, <laughs> Who are you to say otherwise, sir? And again, this has made people think that Cobb's stuck in a dream. Now, it's not too long before we learn the inner workings of Fisher's organisation, and I love how you can catch Eames subtly sitting off to the side. Maurice smashes a photo of him and Robert as a child, and they actually did something very smart with the makeup here. That young Maurice in the photo is actually Killian Murphy wearing a wig and fake moustache, and this was to make it seem like the characters were actually related. Slowly things slot into place, and we see Ariadne mapping out the dreams. Behind her, we can actually see the tower from the snow base, and later on this appears in full effect. This is actually based on the exterior of the Geisel Library at the University of California, showing how Ariadne pulled in some inspiration from real life. 
Now, the entire snow scene was actually based on Nolan's favourite Bond movie, which surprisingly is on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Not one of the best, uh, but yeah, whatever helped to inspire this amazing film director. Now, Nolan purposely used his own favourite films to inspire the different dream levels because, like I said, this is kind of a metaphor for filmmaking. When crafting a movie, directors often bring in work that's inspired them, and they use elements of this to flesh out their creation. This is the same way in which an architect pulls from their own life, but they should never out now copy the things that they've seen. Filmmakers have to deal with this too, and the idea of plagiarism slash inspiration is of course a debate that people have today. Now Nolan has taken this idea to inspire the layers, and the busy city streets are inspired by heat. The Michael Mann classic also heavily influenced The Dark Knight, and it's often said that Nolan's style's very similar to his. The hotel layout was also inspired by The Shining, and it was so cool pouring through the behind the scenes stuff to find these things out. Now Ariadne lifts up a model of the maze, and this iconography appears throughout the entire film. Not only were the streets of Mombasa just like this, but we also see the limbo level pulled from this as well. The buildings that mount the shore extend out like a maze, and there's this constant repetition that's popping up. Cobb doesn't want to see the layers though, because Mal could sabotage it, and we see this happening later on in the film. Left in a desperate position, they have to open up about a shortcut, which Cobb finding out then informs Mal. It's clear his baggage is causing a lot of issues, but he swears it's not, even though we all know how, how the wives ruin everything. Looking, looking at you, Yoko Ono. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. Now, they brainstorm the idea that they want to plan and discuss how this has to be placed deep in the subconscious. We see a newspaper article drop down, and if you look closely at it, the word father is leaping off the page. Subconsciously, this emphasizes how important that the dad is, and the articles that follow this hammer home their relationship. The one on the left side talks about Maurice and Robert, who apparently had a full blown argument at a trendy restaurant. On the other side of this, it talks about Peter Browning, but the bottom paragraph actually holds the most importance. The piece mentions how nepotism is a big factor in business, and how Browning will likely be pushed out because of who Robert is. It talks about how Browning's put his life's blood into the business, but because Robert's got the last name, he's probably going to inherit it. It kind of goes in on Robert and suggests that he doesn't have the merit or ability, and if we look at this like it's a con job, then Robert's definitely the mark. He basically comes out getting con because Sato needs him to destroy the company so that he can dominate the market and then take over. It's corporate espionage, but these elements all come in place to use Robert's inability to lead as what brings it down. Had Browning got the company, it likely wouldn't have fallen apart, but Maurice choosing his son leads to its downfall. A him being chosen helps him plant the idea that his dad actually wanted him to be his own man. We know that's not the case though, as in reality, Maurice viewed him as being a disappointment. He could barely speak, but he took the trouble to tell me one last thing. Disappointment. I'm guessing on his deathbed, he was too out of it to change his will, and they do talk about power of attorney. So the will was potentially drafted up years prior, or maybe he didn't have one, and Maurice may regret what his son turned out like. Kind, kind of feel bad saying this, because I actually I like Robert as well, but yeah, something about this watch through made that stand out for me. I must say, it's the first time I've ever thought about it like that, and maybe on my next watch I will see things differently. What I love about this film is that every time you go back to it, you, you do see something different, and it really adds to the draw of what Nolan's created. Now, as they start to put things in place, we see the group standing around in the streets as Ariadne slowly maps out the terrain. Going back to the filmmaking metaphor, this could be seen as a set with them putting things in place before the actors come in. I love how in the background you can see things slotting down, and Sato's expression in this moment is absolutely great. Guy's never seen anything like this before, and he looks around in wonder while sealers don't. Now they later stand around in the hotel lobby too, and it shows how they went to these locations before carrying out the job. Now whilst this is going on, Yusuf explains the kick and how a falling sensation can be used to wake you up. It's something they of course do when they're on the bridge, and when they're down in limbo and they jump from the skyscrapers. I'm sure we've all experienced falling in a dream, and this sensation normally snaps you out of it. However, it has a deeper meaning, mainly tied to Mal and how she decided to go and end it all. Mal, of course, jumped out of a window and taking her life, and this was probably to give her the sensation of falling. It, of course, killed her too, but we later see how jumping from buildings can wake someone up. Now, during this, she talks about taking a leap of faith, which is something that Sado also said to Cobb. I'm asking you to take a leap of faith. 
Do you want to take a leap of faith? Or become an old man filled with regret, waiting to die alone? It all ties into that idea of regret and may have been used to reinforce the idea that Cobb should go back home. I love the scene set in Cobb's elevator of torment as well, and it's something that we all have that's built within us. I don't mean a literal elevator, but I can't tell you the nights that I've sat up thinking about the past, but rather than staying awake, Cobb handles it in a dream. He spends his nights sedated, going back through his memories, desperate to return to the life he used to have. You're trying to keep her alive. You can't let her go. Now he watches Ariadne descends down and passes by a dollhouse, which we later learns where Cobb did the inception. We also see them together and Mal says, You said you had a dream. Which is something we pointed out that she says later on, but it's also used as a way to taunt Cobb in his nightmares. You said we'd be together! You said we'd grow all together! Come back to you. Great jump scare here as well, with her turning her head, and it reminded me of Nolan doing the one in the dark night. Especially by you and me. Now one thing that people hung on to with the whole is it real slash is it a dream thing is where Ariadne brings up not using real places. On the next floor, we're taking the cops home, and at the end, this is where he returns to. Again, I don't think it's really the case, but you can see how using real places can lead to confusion. We see his cop regrets not seeing his kids' faces for the last time, and he's given a ticket to quickly leave the country. A clue here that the ending is real is also the fact that Cobb's son gets slightly older, and this is actually played by Nolan's real-life son. Anyway, Ariadne makes a break for it and rushes to the elevator, which is when she sees a train before hitting the hotel. Here we see what happened and how Mal trashed the room to make it seem like Cobb actually caused her death. Now speaking of death, we hear how Maurice passed away, and now it's the time that the group need to strike. Robber will be flying out soon, and Sido buys the airline to bring it all together. Eam swipes his passport so Cobb can do a classic con man trick, which is to find a way to introduce himself and also seem like a nice guy. Passing his passport here, he also incepts his water, which allows the character to drug him. However, before he does this, he talks about his dad, and he says, Well, he was a very inspiring figure. I'm sorry for your loss. This is the first part of the Inception, with the focus on the inspiring figure being used as a way to plant the idea that his dad's inspiring. As we know, Inception has to be inspired, and it's from this point that they enter the first layer. It's raining because Yusef needs a Wii, and due to him being the dreamer, the world's influenced by him. That includes a car later on, and they actually chose a song on the radio here because they said that's what Yusef would listen to. Also, before they bump into this taxi, we can see the number on the back, and this reads 2053. This is actually a reverse of the number 3502, which, as we said before, appears on the train. Now, a cool little detail in all that is that all the cars here have their own unique state motto. The phrase the alternate state appears on them all, and this is used as a way to describe dreaming. Now, after the projections swarm them, we learn Fisher has security in place, and to make matters worse, the train comes piling in. Nolan somewhat did this for real, and they used a train with real car tyres on it in order to create the look. Now speaking of creating the look, we see Eames adopting Browning, and I love how you can catch him slowly changing his look. The mirror slowly drops Eames' reflection as the truth comes out, and it's such a cool way to show the transformation. With the train causing issues, Cobb starts to confide in Ariadne, and we see some snippets of their life and how it happened in Limbo. Cobb enjoyed feeling like a god, but he wasn't fully involved in it because deep down he knew that it wasn't real. However, Mal somewhat wanted to remain there, which is why she locked away her totem. This is later used to convince her that nothing was real, and Cobb pushing the boundaries ultimately caused her death. Now, we do get some foreshadowing of what their deaths were like when we see from Cobb's POV as the pair both wake up. They lie in similar positions to how they did on the track, with Mal's head even being like how it was before the train hit. Now, after the projections descend on the location, we see as Eames somewhat gives Arthur an idea. You mustn't be afraid to dream a little bigger, darling. He shows some explosives can help, which is what Arthur later uses in order to supply the kick. As Yusef races to the bridge, the team descend further, and they put a plan in place called Mr. Charles. This involves telling the dreamer that they're in a dream, and it makes a the target then lower their guard. His projections are immediately suspicious, though, and we can actually catch a guard at the bar staring directly at him. 
He gets up and follows Eames as he walks out, and pointing out that he was the woman makes Fisher start to trust him. Telling him he's dreaming, we then watch as the hotel shifts and rain starts to come in from the layer right above. In a really nice detail, when the gravity goes back to normal, you can catch Cobb was balancing himself against Fisher's stool. Now kind of jumping back a bit, but on the napkin we can see the hotel's name is Hotel Valfiano. Eduardo de Valfiano was allegedly a con man who put together a group that stole the Mona Lisa in 1911. Apparently he wished to make copies of it to sell them off to six buyers, but the group were caught and the painting was returned in 1913. Now there's actually no evidence that Eduardo actually existed, so this is a cool little easter egg for the name of the hotel. Now as the group in the dream make their way to the compound, we watch as Arthur sets up the kick on the middle layer. Yusef drives to the bridge so that he can get a high enough drop and he actually flips the projections off as he reverses back. Sometimes I do this to the police as I'm driving past him, and I... Nice little detail that I appreciate. Now the way that the scenes are edited is also a very similar technique to what Nolan would later use in his movie Dunkirk. The top level scenes time length wise are shorter than the middle which in turn are shorter than the bottom level. So just as time gets longer the further down we go on the levels the length of the scenes also does too. A zero gravity is used throughout the hotel and like Ariadna's hair this caused issues planning out the set. However, they realised that hotel staff tend to tuck the blankets and pillows in really tight so they wouldn't float around when the hotel's moving about. Thus, when Arthur enters, the things floating are solid objects, whereas CGI blankets would have been tougher to animate. Now, Arthur closes the case before moving things about, and this is to stop the items in place from going everywhere. Arthur also uses the Penrose steps to take out a projection, and this is a technique that he demonstrated before. This seemingly looping staircase is a callback to MC Escher and it allows Arthur to get the drop on them. Elsewhere we see an avalanche hit caused by the upper layers and Fisher says, Couldn't someone have dreamt of a goddamn beach? Ah. Uh -huh. As we know, Cobb did actually dream up a beach but it wasn't exactly sunshine and rainbows. Now Sido and Fisher end up taking a hidden pathway and this acts as a shortcut through the level. However, on the way, Fisher turns his radio off, and this is due to it making a static noise. That brings with it some consequences, as they later can't warn him that Mal's sneaking in. Also, I love when Eames chucks the explosive at the snowmobile, and he does a little thumbs up as he drives off. You should thumbs up the video and, and subscribe as well, because it's, it's a bloody bloody good channel here. Anyway, after Fisher's killed on this layer, we see his cop in Ariadne descend into limbo. Along the shore we can see buildings crumbling away and the creative team said that this represents memories. In our subconscious they slowly diminish after time and they get lost in the ocean of our brains. In this reality we find the world that the pair built with the architecture getting more complex the further they go on. The buildings initially start off small before evolving into skyscrapers and the designs themselves shift to mimic building work over the last 50 years. Now as they get further in, we see how the homes the pair grew up in have been recreated, but they now look like they're completely falling apart. This is because as the memory of them fades, they slowly start to rot and eventually decay. It leads to a heartbreaking moment in a room in their home, in which Cobb finally decides to move on from Mal. I don't think it's any coincidence either that this is the room in which he finally leaves the top, and it represents the place that he starts a new chapter. He leaves Mal here and then leaves the top and it's from this location that he finally steps forward. Also they kind of jump about with the pronunciation of Mal and Maul in the movie so apologies if you've been in the comments furiously hammering away that I've been saying it wrong. It, it's just me, me stupid Northern England accent and uh, it, Mal is short for Mallory so I've just stated with that. Ruined the entire video for you there but uh, yeah he finally says goodbye to her but he remains behind to find Sado whilst Fisher and Ariadne escape. On the upper level, Fisher comes face to face with his father, who's muttering away the final words that he heard him say. I was just, just, I know, Dad. Just. However, in the dream, the circumstances can be changed, and Maurice gives more dialogue to tell him to be his own man. Inside the safe, he finds a new will along with a windmill that he blew in the photo together. This image is summing up Robert placed by his deathbed because he cared about it rather than Maurice doing it. Thus bringing this across it inspires him further and just like the forever spinning top being inside the safe, this windmill coming from one implants it in his mind. Now the kicks start to get put in place and we see as Cobb goes to Sido. I love the focus on the spinning top which never falls over and as we know this is due to it being a dream. 
Sado could stay with this and remain in the dream forever, but instead his hand moves towards the gun to wake them both up. On the plane we watch as they all come to, and I don't know, just something about seeing them all kind of look at each other really cements the big journey they've gone on. Also, forgot to mention before, but the flight attendant's actually played by Nolan's cousin, who's called Miranda Nolan. Anyway, remembering his promise, Sado makes the call, and we see his Cobb's welcome to America. Welcome home, Mr. Cobb. Thank you, sir. Still get goosebumps now watching him return home, and unlike the locations in the dream, we actually see Cobb arriving here. This confirms it's real, and as he moves through to meet Michael Caine, we can also catch a sign that says Fisher, which is a nice little detail. Entering his home, we see blocks looking like a house on the table and can hear his children talking about building a house on the cliffs. This could end towards his son following in his mother and father's footsteps as an architect and we close out on that outstanding final shot. That wraps up this incredible movie and huge thank you for going back through it with me. I've had such a blast talking about this film and to me it's one of Nolan's many, many masterpieces. This was the movie that showed he could create his own concepts and build something that would define a cinematic generation. Everything about this film's influenced so many after it and even the trailer for it changed the way that trailers were edited. Can't even count how many times the BOOM sound was used and even though it got played out, I still love it because of this movie. And I hope you've had a good time going back through it too. And if we missed anything, then make sure you drop it below. If you want to support the channel for as little as 99 cents a month, then please click the join button below. And as a thank, you'll get early access to these videos. If you want to see us break down more Nolan movies, then definitely check out our video on Interstellar, along with The Prestige, which will be linked on screen now. Without the way, it's been a dream going through this video. I'm off to spend some time with my kids, and I hope to see you next time. You take care, enjoy the rest of your week, and have a good one, mate. Peace.